John a choir. Thank you. Oh my goodness. What a message. Oh, what a message for us today. Uh, church family, just uh, turn with me to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Uh, we'll be beginning in, in verse 13 in just a moment. But uh, as you're turning to that, let me just uh, make a, a quick announcement. Uh, uh, things that are going on, things that are taking place, as you might know, uh, of course, this next week is Vacation Bible School. The week after that is Super Summer. A bunch of our kids and our sponsors are going to be heading over there and being a part of that wonderful, wonderful youth discipleship camp. But then uh, uh, some of us, myself, is, are going to go to Anaheim, California. And not to go to the place of eternal happiness, but rather going to the place of the Southern Baptist Convention. I will be heading there. And you know what? This is one of those has had a lot about news about it, a lot of things about it. Things are going on, taking place. Normally, uh, when I get back, I give a convention report of things that I've heard, things that I've seen. We'll do that again this year, probably the end of June. But uh, I'm, with everything going on, we're going to have a pre-convention report. And so tonight, I'm going to go ahead and just have a moment to be able to share with you some of the things that I'm feeling, some of my concerns, some of the things that are on my heart, and then give you an opportunity to uh, share with me, to go ahead and ask questions. Uh, it's going to, Brother David's going to lead us in some worship beforehand, and then we're just going to talk, and then most importantly, afterwards, we're going to pray. And so if you'd like to be part of that time, I invite you tonight at 6 o'clock. Well... Uh, as training to become a minister, you go through different classes, obviously, in seminary. Some of them are very, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, very academic, the theology classes and, and the, the things that deal with a lot of the things we think about. Some of them are very practical. Some of them deal with the things about how to handle the different schedules and things like that. There's a lot of, a lot of different as, aspects of that. There was one class, though, that I am pretty sure I just missed, and that was the class on how to baptize. Throughout the years, I consider myself pretty well a self-taught baptizer. Now, I consider myself successful in that, in that for every baptism that has gone under, they have also come up. Count it as a win, okay? But as anyone who has worked back in the baptistry will tell you, inevitably, every single time, I, it doesn't matter who, doesn't matter all the circumstances, inevitably, my shirt gets soaked. Now, there is a way to do baptisms where you don't get your sleeve wet. I am confident of that. I just missed the class where they taught us how to do that. So, uh, but you know what? I am perfectly willing to preach in a wet sleeved shirt if it means that we get to celebrate the opportunity of baptism. I'll just take that up to heaven with me and Jesus can teach me the better thing. Well, missing class is one thing. If it's, you can, you can be self-taught, you can figure it out. But our friends, the disciples, they miss the class. There was an opportunity for a teaching moment. There was an opportunity for something to be going on. Uh, the story that we're going to be talking about today, once again, focuses on the dullness of the disciples, of how they just didn't get it. They've been with Jesus seven chapters now, you know what I mean? And they still don't get it. This particular moment, they missed the class. Now, some of the background to the story to get us to Mark chapter 8, as we kind of finished up uh, chapter 7 a little bit, uh, Jesus had done a couple of pretty significant miracles, had done some pretty great things, and then uh, he goes ahead and uh, uh, starts uh, teaching again, the multitudes again gathered, and once again Jesus feeds the multitudes. In Mark chapter 8, that be those first 12 verses, it talks about the fact that Jesus fed 4,000, there were seven baskets left over, it's almost a duplicate of the previous story of feeding 5,000. Numbers are a little bit different. And then the Pharisees get on him. The Pharisees go ahead and uh, start criticizing him. They say, Jesus, show us a sign and we'll believe you. And as Jesus responds, it's almost like he does that. Now, the Bible doesn't record that he slapped his forehead with his hand. Okay, that is just, that is purely interpretation at this point. Because Jesus would say to them, a sign, what? more do you want? 
I have fed two different multitudes. Uh, The deaf now hear, the blind now see. There is a little girl who is alive because I brought her back from death. You want a sign, you've had enough signs. No sign is going to lead you to believe the miracles, the signs, as far as you're concerned, they're done, they're over. Well, in the midst of that, Mark leads us now to Jesus getting in the boat and leaving. And while they're in the boat, well, there's some things that happen, a conversation that takes place, and Jesus rings the bell and says, class in session. And the disciples don't show up. Mark chapter 8, beginning, uh, we're going to go ahead and begin in verse 13. Would you stand with me? Mark chapter 8, verse 13. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Left the Pharisees, left them in their unbelief. Now, they had forgotten to bring bread, and they only had one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? Do you not remember When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces do you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Thank you, you maybe seated. What'd they miss? Jesus had something for them. He had something to share. He had something he wanted to be able to do. He had an agenda for that day. And for some reason, these disciples completely missed it. What did they miss? What did they just not get that day? Well, they missed the lesson. Verse 13 through 16 is going to tell us a little bit about some of the things that Jesus would want, but you could almost write the story yourself, couldn't you? As you start to read that, those few verses, they're in the boat here, and, and they're talking about they only have one loaf of bread, and Jesus uses the bread as an object lesson saying, beware the leaven, which is part of the bread-making process, the yeast, if you would. Be, beware this leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. And the disciples, instead of stopping what they were doing and turning their attention so that Jesus could explain what in the world he meant by the leaven of the Pharisees, they went back to talking about the fact they didn't have any bread. Jesus was teaching an empty classroom. Do you see it? Now, I don't know the agenda of Jesus. I don't know what kind of teaching plan he had for that moment. But I can only imagine that Jesus had the idea that he would teach this great truth. He would go ahead and and just put it out there in in parable and be so eloquent in what was said. And then at the end said, as you can see, the power of my story, let me show you real power. Where's the one loaf of bread? I fed 5,000. I fed 4,000. Let's see if I can take the 13 of us in this boat. You know what could have happened. You know what could have taken place. But it didn't because they weren't there. Oh, they were in the boat. They just weren't in the classroom. They were where Jesus was, but they were more interested in listening to their stomachs than they were listening to the master. And they missed the lesson. They were so concerned about the immediate that they missed where Jesus really wanted them to be able to go. I get that. I understand that. 
I understand the immediate of the hurt, of the pain, the immediate things of the confusion, the discomfort, the fear, the worry. I know what it's like for those things to be in my life and however pressing they might be and how immediately they needed attention in my life. I get that. My therapist wife has said a phrase more times than I could possibly count, no pain, no gain. What's well, great. But Brother Dave lives in a world, no pain. Let's just stop right there, okay? Let's figure out where the no pain is and let's set up residence right there. No pain, no pain. Put it over my mantelpiece. Jesus said, yes, there is pain, there is hurt. In this boat, there is hunger. But I got a lesson. I got a lesson about that that you're going to miss because the only thing you're embracing right now is the immediate. Let's just pretend for a moment that Brother Dave is sitting on the couch watching a little bit of TV. I mean, it's, it, the evening is winding down and, and uh, you know, he's just in his uh, uh, casual at home kind of uh, clothes, bare feet, those kind of things. And all of a sudden, Brother Dave remembers that he needs to go to the kitchen. Now, we're not going to talk about why he needs to go to the kitchen. You can fill in the blank. It might be because that he realizes that the dishwasher needs to be emptied, and he's just going to go ahead and do that to, to just, uh, you know, be a part of the family. It might be he's raiding the refrigerator. I will let you go ahead and fill in the blank on whatever you think is more than likely what took place. But as Brother Dave gets up out of the couch in his bare feet, he puts a foot forward, and on the tile of the dining room, he steps upon a Lego left by one of his grandchildren. Now, you know the evil thing about Legos? It hurts when you step on them. But when you lift up your foot, they are still attached to your foot, waiting for you to step on it one more time. Whatever my agenda was in the kitchen has now suddenly been completely obliterated, completely put on the very, very back burner. I had immediate things to tend to, like blessing my grandchildren. Do you know what I mean? When it hurts, our normal, everyday reaction, how do I get rid of the hurt? Whatever else is going on, make it stop hurting. And yet Jesus comes and says, I've got a lesson for you. Put your hunger to the side and listen. And here's the thing that I find just so interesting at this point. Mark doesn't tell us where Jesus was going with this. The leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod? Not exactly sure. Thinking to the previous experience he had had with the Pharisees, maybe he was talking about unbelief. Maybe he was talking about not trusting him. Maybe he was talking about not seeing the big picture. Maybe he was talking about trusting only in miracles but not getting the real message of the miracles. Maybe a good chance that, but Jesus never got to finish that. Mark never records. Now, maybe Jesus taught them this again at another time. Maybe there's other, other places where, uh, where uh, Jesus had done that. Mark just doesn't record it. Mark just doesn't tell us what that was. All we know is that the agenda of our Lord in the boat was different than the agenda of the disciples. And so for us, tough day, yeah. I mean, how many times this coming week are we going to read the headline of innocent lives that have been taken because of the violent use of guns? Now then, you're thinking right now, Brother Dave's getting ready to say something about gun control. Now, while I may or may not have my own opinions about such matters, certainly willing to discuss with anyone any time what, what, you know, what we're thinking together on, on those things. 
What if today our Lord has a lesson more than about the gun and more about the gunman? What if his emphasis is not upon the weapon, but about the evil heart that wields it? Because really, when all is said and done, we can talk about the tool. But until the soul of the one that uses the tool is changed, we're not going to solve any problem in the world. And Jesus solves the problem in the world, folks. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the one that can take the evil heart and somehow through his shed blood take that which is black and turn it white as snow. That's the gospel. Jesus lifts us beyond just the simple things of the hurt and the pain and the confusion of our lives. They are real and they are worthy of attention. Don't get me wrong. But what if there is something that Jesus is trying to tell us in that? Are you going to show up for class? Are you going to say present when your name is called? There's a lesson, a truth the Lord would have for us in any circumstance of life. Let's not miss the lesson because we're caught up in the pain of the moment. They not only missed the lesson, and this is kind of just, just a little bit farther than that, they missed the greater truth of the lesson. It's an old, old story. We'll call it a parable, but it's just an old, old story. Been around a long time. A young man had just graduated from high school. And he saw that one of the presents he got was a little box from his grandmother. Now, his grandmother had always been very generous on birthdays and Christmas, and he could only imagine what she got him. Maybe, maybe enough there to make that down payment on the car that he's looking for. Oh, that'd be too much. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Well, he opens up the box when he gets home. It's just him. It's there. Him, you know, opens up the box. And he finds inside there a Bible. And on top of the Bible is a little note from Grandma that says, I love you. I'm so proud of you. As you go through life, everything you're looking for is contained in the pages herein. Godly, godly grandmother. Well, the little boy, the, the young man, the high school graduate, is a little bit disappointed, to be real honest. Valuable. You know, okay. Goes ahead and does that, says, rule, thank you note and everything, but he doesn't really look at the Bible. Years later, as an adult now, kids of his own, He's moving, and he cleaning out the closet, finds the box with the Bible in it, pulls out the box, and a little bit different attitude in life, maybe, something else. Maybe a little more tender heart. Uh, we're not sure, of course, but he takes the Bible, and he kind of holds it up, and he kind of flips through a little bit on that. And from out of that Bible falls a piece of paper. And he picks up the piece of paper, and it's a check for $5,000. It's a story, folks, but a story that teaches us. Because not only did he miss the gift, the generous gift, the great gift, his immediate thought was his grandmother, every month going to reconcile that checking account and realizing that he missed it. Because if he wasn't looking at the answers in the book, he was never going to find the tangible answer that she had for him. The tangible answer was great. She could have just given him a check. But she had something far more for him. Something greater for him. Something beyond imagination for him. Something contained within the truth of God. 
and he missed it. He missed the greater thing that was there. Jesus had the hunger of the disciples covered, don't you know? Jesus was not worried about where the next meal was going to come from. He had a greater truth for them, something that this greater truth answered, and that was their greatest need. The need was that they were sinners, separated from God, that they never had any hope of eternity. Well, they needed something to eat, yes, but they needed something that would last far longer. You see, Jesus knows that Jerusalem is drawing near. Their time in Galilee is coming to a close, and soon they're going to be making that trek to Jerusalem, and Jesus knows how that is going to end. And he knows completely how it's going to end, not only in the humiliation by the religious leaders, not only in the painful, agonizing death on the cross, not only the victorious day of resurrection, not only his glorious ascension, but he knows that this little band of non-understanding disciples are going to lead the world in charge of his church when he is gone. Jesus knows their greatest need is found at the cross. A good news. Good news not found in bread that one day will grow stale. But good news in life. And a life that is eternal. They missed the greater truth. Jesus said, Teach them all I've commanded. And maybe that means that it's not simply about the fear of the sickness, but it's about trusting the great physician. Maybe the lesson that he wants us to learn and understand is that maybe it's not about the failure of someone else but it's about us being able to forgive. Maybe Jesus sees the pain in our lives about anxiety and he wants us to learn the lesson of peace. Maybe, just maybe, in learning the greater lesson, Jesus takes care of the immediate need. These disciples missed this truth, and they missed the greater truth that, that is more than just their immediate need, but they missed the opportunity to be able to grow, the opportunity of the truth for tomorrow. You know how it works. You can't take advanced biology unless you have passed basic biology. You get that. You understand that. Whatever is there in that advanced class for you, you're not going to be able to get it until you get the basics down. Verse 21 says, the last thing in this story, and he just leaves it there. He doesn't answer it. He just says, they did not understand. They had so much ahead of them, but they weren't ready for it. They just didn't understand. Paul put it this way in Hebrews chapter 5. He says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he's a child. Paul says there is more for you to be doing, more for you about teaching others, about discipling others, about growing others, but you can't because you have yet to learn the basic lessons of your faith to begin with. You're missing the opportunity to grow. There are a couple of computer terms that I've heard computer people talk about. When talking about a certain number that the computer is working with as it assigns addresses and things like that, as it does what it's supposed to do, sometimes they talk about a static number. It's a number that stays the same. It's a number that doesn't change. 
It's a number that is always there. Every time that computer comes on, that number, wherever it is in the great mix of, of the billions and billions of electrons going on, that number just stays the same. It is static. But sometimes in this computer world that others understand so very well, sometimes that number is dynamic. It means it changes to the real world and the real world situation. You turn on the computer and it figures out what this new number needs to be for the computer to do what it's supposed to do. It's a dynamic number. I've got a question for you. Is your faith static? Set in stone, that's just the way it's going to be. You are stuck where you are from now until Jesus comes back. Or is it dynamic? Is it growing? Do you know Jesus more today than you did yesterday? And what does that say about your tomorrow? I am afraid so many of us got saved at vacation Bible school or at Falls Creek. And we have elected just to stay there. Static. Living in a moment that took place 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. Instead of understanding that the Word of God is applicable, not just to us 20 years ago, but it is applicable for us today. It is real for us, this moment. And we have the opportunity to learn the commandments of God and to move and grow until we get it right, though we can't move forward. Until we go to 101, we're not going to be able to advance to 201. God has so much for us, church family. He has so many things He wants us to do, places prepared for us. He has victories ahead for us, but we got to get it right with the class we're in right now. We've got to be able to listen to what God tells us today. The greater truth, the big truth, the lesson he wants us to hear. And be ready then to grow into the tomorrow that he has for us. Jesus looked at those disciples in that boat. And you can tell just by the way Mark describes it. He is seriously concerned. They still. One day, they're going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. This group who can't get their mind off a loaf of bread are going to be witnesses to the truth that's going to change the world. And yet they still Jesus calls us to a great mission. He calls us to this wonderful journey of faith. He calls us to be his ambassadors, his witnesses. And are we willing to learn the lesson today? Not just to make the pain stop. Not just to to, to be comfortable today, not just for us to be at peace today. Are we willing to learn through the hardship of the moment, trusting Him that we might be able to be used for what is getting ready to happen in days, months, years to come? Are we willing to learn the lesson today? So, I'm going to ask you to say a prayer today. During our invitation time, of course, folks, if you're at home, there's an opportunity for you. I'll be sharing with you a, a little, just, just between us in a moment, that, uh, that gives you opportunity to respond. For those who are here, you have an opportunity. I'm asking you to pray. Certainly pray for the need of the moment. Yes, by all means, join me. Lord, it hurts right now. And I sure would like it to quit hurting. 
I'm hungry right now. And I sure would like to be fed. I'm afraid right now. And I sure would like to be at peace. Yes, certainly. But I wonder if you're courageous enough to say the next prayer. Lord, regardless of how that previous prayer is answered, Lord, teach me. Teach me the greater truth. The greater truth that prepares me for tomorrow. Lord, teach me your truth in the midst of the broken. In the midst of the cancer, teach me, Lord. In the midst of the headlines, teach me, Lord. In the midst of betrayal, in the midst of heartache, in the midst of fear, in the midst of my broken, teach me. Lord, thank you for our moment today. Thank you, Lord, for your truth. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that uh, one day those disciples would get it. (laughs) One day they would understand. One day they would be witnesses and change the world. So, Lord, in the midst of who we are, in the midst of our brokenness and our heartache, Lord, teach us. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you again for the moment. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So glad you were able to be part of our worship service today. And, you know, my prayer every week is that the Lord would speak. It's not about me. It's not about my opinions or my commentary. It is all about what the Lord Jesus Christ has to say to you the thing that He has for your heart and the direction He has for your life. And I pray today that He has spoken to you. And maybe there's a time sometimes when that that speaking implies a direction. Maybe you need to consider some decisions. Maybe there's something the Lord is saying, not just to think about, but something to take action on. And this is your time. The phone number is there on the screen. You can call the church office. One of our deacons is there ready to go ahead and take your call. Maybe it's a day to accept Jesus as your Savior. You've had some questions about that. But you know, when all is said and done, this is the day of salvation for you. Would you call us? Maybe there's a need in your life for for a prayer. Maybe there's a question about church membership. Maybe there's something else that the the Lord is dealing with in in your life and you just want to be able to have another human being pray with you over the thing that is before you. Give us a call. Let us know. You can also email us if you'd like. But the bottom line is that this is your time. Not just a time just to watch a worship service, but I pray that today has been a day when you've been able to participate in the worship service and the Lord has been able to speak to you. May God bless you and again, thank you for being part of what the Lord is doing in our church today. Let's have a word of prayer. So Lord, thank you for your work. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit that moves and Lord, for the fact that you have a will and a plan for our lives. Continue, Lord, to lead us and guide us this day for it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.